Welcome to From Bench to Bedside, Novel Strategies Addressing Negative Symptoms to Improve Clinical and Functional Outcomes. I'm Dr. John Loriello, the Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Our learning objectives include examining the clinical implications of negative symptoms of schizophrenia on recovery and restoration of function, evaluating clinical trial updates on novel therapies with unique mechanisms of action that address the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, and to integrate pharmacologic knowledge of D3 receptor function into individual treatment selection for the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Let's start by talking about schizophrenia. As many of you know, schizophrenia is a, a illness that really affects functioning, and it has a large number of symptoms. Most of us uh, will immediately think about the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. That includes hallucinations and delusions, disorganized thought. But what isn't always appreciated and what, ha what has the most impact on functioning are the negative symptoms, the lack of normal affect, speech, uh, uh, pleasure, sociality, those negative symptoms and the cognitive problems that people with schizophrenia have that really affects how one does on their day-to-day -day activities. We're going to talk a lot today about negative symptoms. And, and, and in many ways, these are underappreciated and under-reviewed when we think about people with schizophrenia. Negative symptoms are a core feature of schizophrenia. Uh, it, they were described at the onset of the diagnos times that they started talking about the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And as I've mentioned before, they're associated with poor functioning. Studies have shown that there's at least one negative symptom in about half of the patients with schizophrenia. And while they probably are independent of positive symptoms, having a longer duration of positive symptoms seems to be related to worsening of negative symptoms. And in fact, this could be a bit of a chicken and the egg problem in which either positive symptoms create the negative symptoms that we see afterwards or the beginning of the negative symptoms make the positive symptoms worse. They're often very present very early in the illness and they often predate the psychosis and again predict the long-term prognosis. And what makes matters even more complicated is that often our antipsychotics mimic some of the problems that people have with negative symptoms through their side effects, or some mood disorders can look like negative symptoms. Now we will look at a 3D animation illustrating the role of dopamine receptor subtypes in treating negative symptoms. Dopamine controls various functions, including motor activity, cognition, motivation, reward, and emotion. Dopamine receptors are classified as D1-like activation and D2-like activation. D1 activation receptors, which include D1 and D5, are involved in excitation and postsynaptic inhibition, and here you see their locations in blue. In contrast, D2 activation receptors, seen here in green, are involved in pre- and postsynaptic inhibition of the target neuron, with some overlap in D1 activation receptors. The variation in location contributes to their functional differences and make them potential different targets for treatment. So when I first started um, in my residency, there was a real debate about whether schizophrenia was localized to just one area of the brain or more generalized. And I think now, some 30 years later, most people believe that schizophrenia is really a generalized disorder of the brain. And you see in this slide a, a, a conception of the idea that many parts of the brain are affected in schizophrenia. And these many parts of the brain can, can account for all the various symptoms we talked about before. So potentially the positive symptoms come from the mesolimbic system, the mood problems from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the negative symptoms coming from the mesocortical prefrontal cortex, and the nucleus accumbens and the reward circuits. And the idea here, the take home point here, is that we have an illness that if it affects all of the brain is going to have lots of different symptoms. And we also know that there are different neurotransmitters in the brain that are implicated in schizophrenia. And of course the most famous and the most well understood is dopamine. And dopamine has 
a lot to do with the positive and negative symptoms uh, of schizophrenia and their improvement. But we know that the difference between the first generation and the second generation antipsychotics is the addition of affecting serotonin in these second generation antipsychotics. And that seems to help somewhat with mood, with the cognitive function, and some of the negative symptoms. And then there are some less well-studied neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, GABA, acetylcholine, and glutamate that are involved in schizophrenia, but we don't quite understand completely how that uh, works, and nor do we have uh, treatments that p particularly pertain to those neurotransmitters. In addition to the different neurotransmitters, we also have uh, different receptors when we talk about dopamine. And the way to think about this probably is to think of the two big families of dopamine receptors. That's the D1 family and the D2 family. The D1 receptors family, which includes D1 receptors and D3 receptors, are really involved in the idea of working memory and attention. In, and, and so they're less involved in the, in the psychotic symptoms we see in schizophrenia, which are more involved in the D2 family. And here we see the D2 receptors, the D3 receptors, and the D4 receptors. All are involved in reward, antipsychotic uh, effects, emotion, uh, and so affecting the D2, the D3, and the D4 receptors may be excellent targets for treating schizophrenia. Let's go back to our 3D animation and take a look at the dopamine pathways and their clinical implications. Dopaminergic neurons are organized into four pathways, the mesocortical, mesolimbic, nigrostriatal, and tuber infundibular pathways. These pathways are relevant to the ability of antipsychotics to produce both therapeutic and adverse effects. Let's start with the mesocortical pathway. Dopaminergic pa projections in the mesocortical pathway project to brain regions that mediate negative symptoms, working memory, and attention. With abnormal dopaminergic levels, either high or low, in the mesocortical pathway, memory can suffer. Antipsychotics can worsen negative symptoms and cognition by blocking dopamine receptors in the mesocortical pathway. In the mesolimbic pathway, dopaminergic projections originate in the VTA, then spread to key areas involved in emotion and reward systems. This pathway is implicated in the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Antipsychotics that decrease positive symptoms block dopamine receptors in the mesolimbic pathway. There are also negative implications of dopamine antagonism. The nigrostriatal pathway is related to the neurological side effects caused by D2 antagonists, including extrapyramidal symptoms. It contains about 80% of the brain's dopamine. It's involved in motor planning, with dopaminergic neurons stimulating purposeful movement. Likewise, dopaminergic projections in the tuber infundibular pathway influence prolactin release. Blockade of D2 receptors by antipsychotics increase prolactin levels, leading to a number of hormonal-related side effects. Dopaminergic system functioning and its projections are important in understanding how antipsychotics modify dopaminergic transmission. Appreciating the mechanisms of action of therapeutic strategies should help facilitate, facilitate personalized treatment selection in patients with predominant negative rather than positive symptoms. So we've been talking about these dopamine receptors and specifically about the D3 receptor. Nearly all the currently available antipsychotics are mainly D2 receptor blockers. And they, have, they may have some D3 receptor affinity, but it's much less than their D2 receptor. If we were to target the D3 receptor rather than the D2, we might have some additional treatment options, and we certainly might have a better tolerated treatment, since the D3 receptor tends not to be involved in the nigrostriatal or tuber infundibular tracts. Blockade of the D3 receptor could improve negative symptoms by disinhibition of dopamine release, leading to enhanced neurotransmission. Now here, this slide shows the, binding, the relative binding affinities of most of the antipsychotics that are available in the United States. 
And what you see, as we talked about before, is that most of the antipsychotics predominantly block the D2 receptor. A few others uh, also block some of the D1 receptor, and even fewer, cariprazine and blonserin, block the D3 receptor. Blonserin is an antipsychotic that's approved in Asia and is not available in the United States. Let's go down to the receptor level and look at the role of the D3 receptor and how it may be a treatment target. In this animation, we've drilled down to the neuronal level to illustrate how partial antipsychotic agonists act on both D2 and D3 receptors. Dopamine binds to the postsynaptic receptor, causing downstream effects on the neuron. The addition of a pure dopamine antagonist blocks dopamine from binding to these dopamine receptors. These dopamine antagonists do not discriminate where they cause their blockade impeding dopamine transmission in areas where there might be too little dopamine, contributing to the worsening of negative and cognitive dysfunction. Like dopamine antagonists, dopamine partial agonists block the dopamine receptor, but unlike the, the antagonists, they produce downstream effects of dopamine, but to a lesser extent, allowing a more balanced dopamine transmission. The net effect in schizophrenia is effective treatment of positive symptoms as well as improvement in negative symptoms. Therefore, agents that act as partial dopamine agonists, particularly with higher affinities for D3 receptors than D2 receptors, have been shown to improve the negative symptoms in schizophrenia better than a full D2 antagonist, with the additional benefit of lower EPS. As was illustrated in the animation, we have currently three dopamine partial agonists available in the United States. They include aripiprazole, brexpiprazole, and cariprazine. Aripiprazole is the oldest of these and has been around for about a decade and has more affinity for the D2 receptor than the D3 receptor. Brexpiprazole and cariprazine are newer and also are dopamine partial agonists, with cariprazine having more D3 affinity than D2 affinity. Here's some data looking at uh, some of these partial agonists. Here's Brexpiprazole, which shows that it's an effective antipsychotic. This is the, the reduction in the total PAN score. There's been some work looking particularly at negative symptoms and cariprazine, and here it is against placebo, in which it shows that, that Carpiprazine is good both for positive symptoms, as all antipsychotics are, as well as for negative symptoms. And in the following study, aripiprazole, risperidone, and carmiprazine were compared to each other on negative symptoms. And this data shows that the higher dose carpiprazine was the most effective for treating negative symptoms compared to placebo and even compared to aripiprazole, with risperidone being somewhat in the middle. And if you look at the response rates of these drugs in terms of numbers needed to treat, it's clear that this high-dose cariprazine, which uh, has this greater D3 affinity, was significantly better than, than the aripiprazole and the placebo in terms of its effect on negative symptoms. So in conclusion, we have several SMART goals that we have identified. First, individualized treatment planning for schizophrenia based on the presence of not only positive but negative symptoms is very important, especially when we think about improving functioning. Identifying the limitations of traditional D2 targeted therapies in managing the negative symptoms of schizophrenia and promoting remission and recovery. And improving clinical outcomes in patients with negative symptoms of schizophrenia by implementing therapies with higher affinities for D3 rather than D2 receptors dopamine receptors. Thank you for uh, taking the time to watch this webinar. I hope this has uh, broadened your knowledge and improved your clinical practice.